The Ontario Diagnostic Days on realagriculture.com is brought to you by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, the University of Guelph, Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, and sponsored by the Grain Farmers of Ontario, Agris Co-op, BASF, Bear and DeKalb, Corteva and Pioneer, Great Lakes Grain, The Mosaic Company, and Syngenta. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin and welcome to Ontario Diagnostic Days. It's episode number six and today we're going to focus on sprayer application. Everything from identifying disease, choosing control products and the right application methods. We're going to kick things off with Dr. David Hooker, Associate Professor from the University of Guelph. Dave will take a look at 20 years of spraying research and technology and discuss how we're now much more capable of tackling diseases like Fusarium head blight. We're then joined by OMAFRA field crop pathologist, Albert Tenuta. We'll travel through corn research plots to learn how to best select fungicides to control diseases such as northern corn leaf blight. Tenuta will then share pre-harvest tips on how to assess corn fields for gibberella and other ear rots. Next up, we're joined by Jason DeVoe, OMAFRA's application technology specialist. Jason and his friends will help us understand spray droplets and how to hit your target for optimum spray coverage. After that, Albert Tenuta returns to help us identify and control gray leaf spot in corn. DeVoe and Hooker then join forces to evaluate spray application performance. They'll look at everything from aerial application to ground rigs and share their results and their recommendations. Again, CEU credits are available for CCAs who have registered for Diagnostic Days. Look for the URL where you can apply for your credits. You'll see that on the screen at various points throughout the episode. Again, this episode, we want to give you an opportunity to engage with our experts. We've added their contact information at the end of the episode, and we also encourage you to put your comments and your questions in our YouTube comments section as you're watching the video. We'll get those comments to our experts and we'll get you some answers. Here's episode number six. I'm Dr. Dave Hooker, Ridgetown Campus, University of Guelph. I've been involved with managing, developing strategies for managing Fusarium head blight in both wheat and dawn in corn, Gibrella ear rot in corn for 20 years. And we started this project in, in wheat uh, essentially, in 1996, there was a, um, just a monster epidemic in wheat. And right then we knew that we had to spend some effort on developing strategies to manage Fusarium head blight and Dawn mycotoxin accumulation in wheat. So this is what we did in 1996. 1996 and the end of 1997, the cultivar resistance, the number of cultivars available uh, that were that tested highly susceptible to Fusarium head blight. Forty percent of the cultivars were in that category that tested highly susceptible to Fusarium head blight, and only a few, less than one percent, tested moderately resistant. But today, 2017 to 2020, we have forty percent of our cultivars are in the moderately resistant category, and only ten percent of our cultivars are highly susceptible. So the progress in plant breeding, thanks to the plant breeders and the Ontario Cereal Crop Committee have been tremendous since 1996. So that's one milestone since 1996, how we've improved on Fusarium head blight management uh, in wheat. The second strategy, second milestone that goes into this management would be uh, uh, fungicide. Fungicide technologies have increased tremendously uh, since 1996. Now with the latest fungicides we can expect between 50 and at the most 60 percent reduction in dawn with a timely application of a fungicide. We did not have that 
in 1996. And then with all of our other studies, we know that if you can combine cultivar resistance or partial resistance, the best cultivar resistance plus a fungicide, timely fungicide application of the right fungicide, we can reduce dawn in wheat by 80% compared to a highly susceptible cultivar with, with no fungicide. So this is just a tremendous strategy and we've also developed application technologies just to try and lift that, that floor up in terms of fungicide efficacy as high as possible uh, for application in wheat. Now for corn, corn we've had epidemics usually happens every four years, but there's localized uh, areas of Ontario that have had uh, serious dawn issues or gibberella ear rot issues in corn. But corn is, we can say that corn is about probably 20 years. We are behind 20 years in management in terms of comparing corn, our management strategy with corn compared to that of wheat. And this is why, this is why we've invested Ontario Corn Committee, uh, seed companies, corn seed companies, uh, and, and others as well, university and private, private industry as well. We've all come together to develop a strategy similar to wheat, similar to the timeline that we've done for wheat, but do this in corn. And so we, we started a, a fusarium nursery where we have a misting nursery. We missed a number of hybrids. And at the end of the season, we collect the hybrids and analyze them for dawn. We know from previous experiments that corn hybrid, the variability in corn hybrid for dawn ranges can range up to four times. So the highest susceptible hybrids can have four times the amount of dawn compared to the average hybrid. And we know that 10% of the hybrids have less than one half the average. So we know that there are hybrid differences and we just need to sort this out, sort the variability out. We need to answer the question, how consistent those low hybrids are and how consistent those high hybrids are in terms of environment, uh, weather patterns, and from year to year variation and also spatial variation uh, within the field as well. Let's talk about application technologies. The application technology or the choice of application of a particular fungicide can have extreme varied outcomes. Of course, we want our fungicides to behave, to perform the best, and that involves getting it on at the right timing, but also how it's sprayed on the crop can have tremendous results, tremendous effect on how well that fungicide works. Currently, as I mentioned, fungicides in both corn and wheat, we can probably expect 50 to 60% reduction in dawn or disease at best. So we need to do whatever we need to do to, uh, to increase our efficacy of fungicides in both wheat and corn. So we discovered this in wheat and research that we've done uh, 20 years ago with Helmut Spicer of Ovamafra and Dr. Art Sasma and others as well. We looked at different fungicide application technologies in wheat and we discovered tremendous differences in how much chemical is delivered to our target. And so our target, of course, in wheat, we wanted the fungicide uh, to, um, to be applied to the wheat head at flowering time. And so if part of the wheat head was not covered uh, with a fungicide, that part of the head, those kernels that would represent that part of the head, they would be essentially not treated as if no fungicide was applied at all. So we want, our objective is to get as much chemical as possible on the wheat heads, but also uniform coverage Coverage is extremely uh, important as well. So coverage, the target of the wheat head is quite unique compared to, let's say, herbicide coverage on a flat leaf. On a wheat head, we have uh, an upright target and we want panoramic coverage around that target. So this is quite an application, like engineering challenge here to get uniform coverage around that wheat head. So this is some of the studies that we did 20 years ago. We've done a lot of this work 20 years ago, and many of you are relatively new, maybe a new agronomist, and maybe you're not quite aware of this research, but it's just fantastic research that we did 20 years ago. 
We looked at aerial application systems. We looked at the airplane and we looked at the helicopter. So we had uh, custom applicators come in and they volunteered their time. And we also compared ground rigs with those aerial rigs as well. Those aerial rigs delivered uh, between four and five uh, gallons per acre, just depending on the experiment and the year. And the ground rigs were all set up to do 20 gallons per acre. So one of the things that we needed to do was to um, look at or investigate the variability of coverage. And what we used, we used a water sensitive paper and we used a vial, a glass vial, and we wrapped the glass vial with the water sensitive paper. And then we put that vial on a steel stake in, um, in, in the wheat field, like you see in, uh, in this picture right here. So we did that and we had, for every spray treatment that we had, we had 180 of those vials and, and water sensitive papers out in the field. We compared variability across the boom, booms of both the aerial applicators and the ground rigs as well. And we also compared the variability within the swath uh, as well, so down the swath. So we have all this, these sampling cards we want to determine which sprayer had the highest coverage and also the most uniform coverage and we can analyze that or we can um, detect that using all of these water sensitive papers that we had spread out. And in addition to that, we had, we could test wind effects as well. So we did this various spray directions and then we can analyze the impact of wind the effect of wind on coverage as well. So we have lots of great data. And one of the things that we come across was we, we looked at some nozzle configurations and some performed very well and others did not perform very well at all in terms, especially with water coverage on the paper as well. And so to get around that, because we had four gallon per acre with the aerial systems, 20 gallon per acre with the ground systems, and to get around that, we put copper sulfate in with the spray solution, and we did had that, that copper sulfate, we applied it at the same rate. So the copper sulfate wasn't, we weren't interested in the sulfate or the copper per se, we were interested in how much of that chemical, how much of that copper was applied to the weed head and how uniform it was. So when we're comparing different volumes, spray volumes, of course the water coverage will be different, but we needed to look at the chemical coverage, how much copper uh, was um, acquired or the uniformity on one sprayer system versus another sprayer system. So we have uh, really interesting data with that. So that was our, our first year. So our backward and forward design, we had more than uh, three times the amount of coverage, the copper coverage, the chemical coverage, compared to uh, a lot of the other sprayer technologies. The aerial systems looked very poor in terms of water coverage, but chemical coverage, the aerial systems were very similar to just the straight nozzles pointing straight down, and even the twin jet nozzles, they were kind of in the same category. But the one treatment that stood out from everything else was the backward and forward design. So that was our first year. And then we went into the second year, so we looked at other sprayer configurations, and we discovered that the backward and forward design was equal to what we call an alternating turbo flood jet design. And these systems generated twice as much chemical and much better coverage across the weed heads compared to, let's say, a twin jet design or nozzles pointing straight down. Now, this twice as much coverage could imply that the fungicide efficacy could be twice as much as well. And so it's very difficult to make that assessment, but we know from our studies that in high disease scenarios that the better the coverage, the better the fungicide efficacy is. If we want high fungicide efficacy, we better make sure that it's timed properly according to the uh, fungicide application timing on the label and also make sure that it's applied correctly as well. We need to do both. And if you can't do it right, I would say, you know, you just may as well keep the fungicide in the jug. It's just too expensive of a chemical uh, and application process with tramping and whatnot to do this to your field and expect a positive, positive outcome.
Hello there, my name is Albert Tenuta, field crop extension pathologist with the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs based out of Ridgetown. We're going to go through some of our plots here on campus today and we're going to talk about fungicides. Important part is we know fungicides are an effective tool, effective disease management tool, but how do we get them to work better? What are some of the factors that you should consider to maximize that return on investment? First of all, we start with the genetic side. Are you looking at a more susceptible, a tolerant hybrid? Those are factors that you want to consider. Where, what diseases are we targeting? Are we targeting northern corn leaf blight, gray leaf spot? Are we targeting ear rots and maybe mycotoxin production? Those are important factors to consider and those will also impact your timing side. Our, for foliar diseases, often we're looking at that tassel application get as much of that coverage on those leaves as possible. If it's ear rots or dawn mycotoxin product, um, uh, reduction, then we're going to be targeting those silk, merged silks and get that fungicide where we need them. The other thing to consider also is what's your history? What's your disease risk? Whether it's a history of, of northern corn leaf blight, you've had a history of uh, ear rots and other diseases, stock rots and that in that field as well, is an important piece to, 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 to consider the weather conditions, your residues, all of those things are important. And finally, you want to consider the fungicide. You know, what's its efficacy? Is it, is it more efficacious on foliar leaf diseases or those specific diseases that you're targeting? Or are they more targeted, say, to those ear rots and, say, mycotoxin? So those are important things to consider. As you consider those and check those off, then you can increase your return, your likely return on investment. Here we are in our plots, and you can see this is our northern corn leaf blight fungicide trial. And this is one that we work working with our U.S. colleagues, the Corn Disease Working Group, as well as many of my uh, U.S. state pathologists, the grain farmers of Ontario, through CAP and cluster funding as well. We're working at looking at disease efficacy for various different fungicides. First of all, we inoculate these plots. At the eight to 10 leaf stage we go in, we inoculate in the world with a mixture of uh, northern corn leaf blight um, spores. And what we see here is you can tell automatically that we got a good catch here. Here is our untreated check. We still get the odd uh, lesion that's come in because of just movement of those spores compared to a check. Here's another, here's a hybrid uh, inoculated plot, and you can see we've got considerable amount of disease in here. And we'll talk about northern corn leaf blight, those typical elongated cigar-shaped lesions that we see that could start off as just small water-soaked lesions, start getting larger, elongated, eventually start blighting up a lot of that leaf. You can see the sporulation, and then you can see also tattering of or ripping of those leaves as well as the disease extends. And in most cases, you will see that progression from where the disease starts and move its way up, up the plant. We've had very favorable conditions. Well, we have not, no irrigation in here, but we've had heavy dews, lots of rainfall, very good um, favorable conditions for northern corn leaf blight. One of the reasons that northern corn leaf blight is our most important or common or problematic foliar leaf disease in Ontario is that we're seeing more and more races developing that are able to bypass that tolerance that's available in, in our hybrids out there. This was a hybrid that was uh, had more tolerance four or five years ago. It is now considered a susceptible variety. This is one we've kept um, that will no longer be on the market or has not been on the market, but we've kept it for our susceptibility. It works great. You can see I'm just the happiest pie with the amount of disease. And as we go through this, you'll even see even more disease. Now remember, if I'm smiling, you might not be, but hey, it worked. So here again, here's our inoculated checks. You can see again, we've got quite a bit of disease here. We've got basically disease um, that's basically gone up, early senescence on this hybrid, um, showing quite a bit of disease. Now, what does it look like if we've got a, made the right choice with the right timing and the right fungicide? Here is an effective fungicide. This is one of our, this is actually an experimental fungicide that we're looking that, as you can see, these inoculated um, rows here, again, we still have disease present and we have 
um, you know, the disease here, so it's not immune or it will not eliminate it, but you can see the vast difference between the inoculated and a very effective fungicide. The other thing is we had the timing right on this one. This was at the tassel timing. And again, recommendation is tassel timing with the right fungicide and you can get very good effective disease control here. So what happens if we take that fungicide and put it on the wrong timing on the plant? Here we're looking at the R3 application, so later application. And why are we looking at an R3? You've heard of tar spot. Tar spot is a disease that's been in the U.S. for the past three, four years. It's moved up to Michigan. We're concerned about tar spot in Ontario. We still haven't detected it, but it will eventually show up in Ontario. What they've seen in the U.S. is that R3 application, because the disease, the tar spot comes in later, fungicide application at that timing is the most effective in most cases. So we're evaluating those R3 applications. So that very effective fungicide at tassel, look what happens when we don't put it on, on the right timing. Now we're looking at that R3 application. The disease, it's, it's less than what we've seen in our checks, but again, more disease here than we would like. So again, the right choice fungicide, if you don't have it at the right timing, you can lose all the benefits you get from that product. So when it comes to fungicides, making the right choice, making sure that it's targeting the right disease or pathogen that you've got is critical to being successful in disease management. So let's go take a look at a, a, a fungicide here that's been on the market for a few years. And it, as you can see under this particular a pressure where we've got a susceptible hybrid, we've got early disease onset with good disease pressure. You can see, and at our right timing, our tassel timing, you can see that our control levels are not acceptable. So again, making sure you've got the right product, the right timing for the right disease can make you successful. So one thing we found last year in our results was that if you had products that had you know, as more and more products are coming out, these products have more than one mode of action. So instead of having, say, a, a group 11 um, uh, product or a, a group 3 or group 7, so instead of the group 11 QIs or strobulurins, the DMI tries all group 3s, or those, have, we're starting to see the introduction of group 7s, SDHIs as well. And so the more of these actives or the more modes of action, we're seeing an increase in efficacy in many cases. So in many, also that means that for, for, from a producer standpoint, you're seeing less and less single mode of actions or single active ingredients products. You're seeing many of these combo products. And some of the benefits, this is a great example of some of those benefits of having those multiple modes of action. And we saw that last year in our, our yield results. Here is an untreated, uninoculated check. You can see, again, you know, there's a little bit of disease here um, that's, that's moved in, but again, it's very clean, very, you know, acceptable. Here is that fungicide. This is a multiple mode of action, a three-way product here. It's got very good control. You know, we're still seeing disease, but look at that. Compared to what we've seen with those susceptible varieties, the performance is there. So again, as we start seeing more and more combo products with multiple modes of action, we also can see very good efficacy occurring. So remember we talked about getting genetics to work for you. Here we are in a looking at a more tolerant hybrid here. Same fungicide that we were looking at before. Remember on that susceptible hybrid where we had considerable amount of northern corn leaf blight, a more tolerant variety has the ability to at least reduce the incidence and severity that we would see on that susceptible hybrid. First thing you should notice right away is it's much greener down here. Even in our other inoculated fungicide trials in here, you can see we've got less disease going here. So what happens if we take that fungicide, we add tolerance now to it, we have the right timing, which is the tassel application here, that foliar leaf disease timing. Let's take a look. We see very little disease here. Very acceptable, very promising. In here you can see we still have a little bit of disease, but not a lot compared to what we had previously as we go through here. Um, you'll notice that we have very little disease in here. The fungicide has worked, the, the genetics has worked, the everything is, is working for our benefit. 
or ultimately for your benefit as well. So take that integrated approach. Use your genetics, use your fungicide, effective fungicides, choose the right one, put it on at the right timing, put all those things together, you'll have better disease control and ultimately a better return on investment. And of course, it makes you more money. So one final message here, remember back in our other plots there where we talked about a fungicide choice and not getting the right fungicide. Here we have that tolerant variety. We have inoculated again and we see some disease in here. The tolerance is helping. But remember, if we have the wrong fungicide, wrong choice here, look what happens. You, as you come through here, you'll see the vast difference between that the one we just showed you where we had very little disease. Here we see considerable amount of northern corn leaf blight. We see that it's senescing. We see it's, it's closer to maturity than the other. So we're losing yield. We're seeing more disease. So again, make that right choice, tie it in. If you make all the other choices, but select the wrong fungicide, that will have a negative impact potentially on your control. So as we prepare for a corn harvest and that, some of the pre-harvest or things that you need to do on your pre-harvest assessment is get out there, scout. Look for things such as, you know, bird injury. Look at areas of the field that have had issues and that. But more importantly, look at those cobs. Look at those ears and that. And look for those nice, healthy, you know, full of grain, maximize yield cobs that we see here. You know, we also see though, this year we've had insects, so whether it's western bean cutworm, bird injury, other factors that are injuring the cob, opening that wound, allowing say fungal pathogens such as gibberella ear rot, um, or gibberella in there, developing into gibberella ear rot, and ultimately say mycotoxins, or Dawn in particular here. Those are things that we want to be careful of. We've had environmental conditions this year, depending on where you are, where we've had frequent rains, heavy dews, nowhere near like what we had in 2018, but more so than what we had last year. So we are starting to see some molds out there. So keep that in mind, get out there. Hey, and what to look for? Here, we're into our gibberella um, fungicide screening uh, trial here, and you can see these inoculated rows here, and you can see right off the bat, you can start, you can see that that is infected. You can see that tight husk, you can see the black um, associated with that. You know, as we start peeling this back, you're gonna start seeing some, yeah, there you go. There's your white mycelium. You can start seeing that pink mold color associated with it. We know we got some pretty good take when we inoculated these. And this is, this is cool. Look at, cool, look at that. We've got perfect gibberella ear rot. You see that white, the white mold. You see the pink color associated, but you also notice where you see it, see the mold on the ear itself. Diplodia ear rot is one that we often will see as well in Ontario. It starts from the bottom up, white mold as well. Fusarium, often where we've got insect or bird feeding, you'll see brown kernels scattered throughout. Gibberell ear rot um, is, is key where we see it starting from the top, from the silks, works its way down through the silk channels, and then works its way from the tip, ear tip down. This is classic gibberella ear rot here. And you can see we've got a good catch um, in here. And unfortunately, we will have mycotoxins in there. So for this year, keep that in mind. As you get out there, start planning to do your scout. Look for, your, for ear rots in that. If you've got any, you know, for stock rots or ear rots, if you're seeing that five, 10%, you may want to target those fields for harvest earlier than later. You know, final messages to keep in mind is that the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs every year does an ear rot and dawn survey. So that information can be utilized by producers, industry, so that we can be proactive. If we have an issue, we can get things started and moving, such as what we saw in 2018. Now remember, you know, whether it's gibberell ear rot, foliar leaf diseases such as northern corn leaf blight and gray leaf spot in that, use the tools that you have available. Use those foliar, those disease resistant or tolerant varieties, whether for northern or for gibberella ear rot in that as well. Use those fungicides, that timing, again, that, that tassel application versus say that silk timing application. Use every, all your tools available to help minimize the impact of disease.
So I'm Jason DeVoe, I'm the Application Technology Specialist with OMAFRA, and we're going to do a little diversion from what you've heard so far, because nothing makes fascinating television like talking about the ballistic movements of droplets, physics, and thermodynamics. But bear with me. Before we explain what we did, i got to tell you how droplets behave or don't behave. So let's start by saying volume is cubic. You can write that down. What that means is, if I have a very large droplet, it's got enough volume to create a lot of small droplets. In fact, if I have a 100 micron diameter droplet and break that into 50 micron diameter droplets, I have eight times as many droplets. So when we're thinking about droplet size and coverage and how they move, we first have to understand what volume and droplet size means. In fact, if we had a 500 micron droplet, which would be very coarse, and we broke it into 10 micron droplets, which would be almost missed, we'd have 125,000 droplets for the same amount of volume. So you can see why it's appealing for an applicator to think, well, I'm going to really improve the odds of coverage by using smaller and smaller droplets. Sadly, they don't behave quite the same way. So think of this for a moment. A nozzle creates a whole range of droplet sizes. When you go buy a nozzle and they say use a coarse or a very coarse droplet size, think of that more as the average of what that nozzle produces. In fact, there's a small amount of volume that's quite fine and a small amount of volume that's quite coarse, just like a normalized bell curve. I'm sure we all look at those every day. But the point is this. Some of that volume is taken up by really big, fat droplets, and some of that volume is taken up by very, very fine ones. Which means no matter what nozzle you have, there's going to be a huge number of very tiny droplets in the spray. Now that's not a bad thing, because we get to take advantage of how the big ones move and how the little ones move. Let's think of it like this. The coarse droplet moves ballistically. What that means is it'll move in the direction it's been fired. It's going to hit the very first thing it encounters. We can predict where it's going to go. Outside forces like wind, thermals, things like that, don't tend to deflect it very much. On the other hand, we've got the fine droplets. Fine droplets don't have anywhere near as much mass. What that means is when they're released from a nozzle, they're going to be really fast for a second, and then they're going to slow right down. Think of throwing a feather through pudding. It's not going to go very fast. Once they slow down, they become a slave to whatever's around them. At the moment, we've got wind coming from my right, which means all those droplets are going to start moving with that wind. Maybe we've got thermals, convection coming up from the ground. Any number of things can affect how droplets behave. This is what it does for us. Well, we were wandering the fields and we found a, a local homeless person who's happy to help us out with this demonstration. This is my target. You'll note that we're standing at a, an effective social distance, way too far for droplets. That should be 50 centimeters, but this is the best we can do. Let's talk about how droplets move from where they are in the nozzle to where we want them to go. We'll start with a coarse droplet, really heavy, and as we talked about, it moves ballistically. It moves predictably. We know it'll move in a straight line and land on the first thing it encounters, like this fellow. Boop! Kind of like that video with the cannonball and the guy who bounces in slow motion. Sit-ups, baby. I'll help you out. Don't look too close at me. Fine droplets, as we said, the rule of eight, we have lots more of them for the same volume. And they're very, very tiny. They may start out at a certain speed, but they get caught up in whatever environmental forces hit them. So let's try again. Actually, I'm surprised any of them hit you. They did. So we've done this a few times, and depending on where the wind goes, that's where they go. And that's the point. The fines will go wherever thermals or wind take them. Now let's do this again. This time, here's my fines. I have no end to them. I'll make them nice and fine. Toss them hard. Hard. Because you think it maybe if I use more pressure behind a fine, they're going to go further. Absolutely. Well, let's find out. Let's see if the wind cooperates pressure on a nozzle actually makes droplets even finer. And while they may go a little faster to begin with, it's still kind of like throwing a feather through pudding. They're only going to go so far so fast. So I'll really let them have it. That really worked badly. Let's be fair. Try it again. Okay, well, some hit you, some even stuck. And droplets do stick to targets better than coarser ones. We'll get to that in a minute. Now, if I were to throw this coarse droplet as hard as I can, take a deep breath. Don't forget. No, I, Newton. No, I. Most of my targets don't shoot back. I'm. I'm not going to do that. I like Albert too much. But if I were to throw this harder, more pressure, it would move in a straighter line, faster, and we could guarantee where it was going to hit. So, as a grower, as an operator of a sprayer, you're thinking, I want the benefit of all those little droplets and their randomness, but I also kind of want to tell them where to go. 
How do we tell random little droplets where to go? We did an experiment to find out. In this video, we have a coarse droplet. And just like the corn cob with Albert, it moves somewhat erratically, but more or less in a straight line to hit the target, which is this screen door. However, when we use fines, we may have more droplets, but they're unpredictable. Here we have three finer droplets that have been released into the wild. And as you can see, they move in circles with turbulent eddies. They follow convection. Some will arrive at the target. Some will even settle on the backside of a target. And some don't make it at all. Spray will deposit in two stages. First, it deposits actively. That happens more or less right away. It is usually the coarser droplets. It means that they fire ballistically right into the target. Then there's secondary. In the case of secondary, this can happen five or eight seconds after the sprayer's gone by. And it's when, like those kids, all the droplets kind of swirl around and land on different targets. So how do we find that balance between getting the droplet where, it wants, where we want it to go and still using enough of them to ensure that random coverage? Well, the first thing we do is we think about the canopy or the target from the droplet's perspective. If we're doing a broadcast application from over top, we want to get the boom pretty close to the target, close enough that the spray is shot into the canopy itself before it starts moving around. Uh, in the case of Ariel, that's why they fly so low. Those fine droplets that they release, they want them as close to the target as possible. Once they're in, you're going to see preferential coverage or more coverage at the top of the target. Think of it like a filter. Of course, if it's sprayed from above, you're going to get more interception at the top versus the bottom. So if we're looking to get sprayed down here, say on a corn tassel, we're asking that droplet to come down through the top, turn left, go around this leaf, come this way and land on the tassel. That's a lot to ask of a droplet. So using fines mean we have more of them, more randomness in the hope that that's the case. After product choice and timing, the next most important thing is application technology. And last year I worked with Albert Tenuta and Dave Hooker to look at the merits of different forms of application in corn. Basically, we compared two different aerial application methods, one fixed wing and one rotary, to several different ground rig applications. There's a lot more interest in ground rig applications in corn in recent years, and we wanted to see was there any really big difference between different setups? Now, first and foremost is the difference between air and ground rig. Aerial units use maybe five gallons per acre, super fine droplets relative to what ground rigs use, say up to 20 gallons per acre, and coarser droplets. This is what potentially the coverage is that you can expect. Now, I shouldn't have to tell you left or right which one of those cards represents finer droplets and which represents coarser droplets. Now, that's pie in the sky. In reality, we probably won't get that. But ideally, that's what we're looking for. Here are the pros and cons of aerial versus ground rig methods. For ground rigs, the pros are that we have flexible timing. You can go in when you want. We have flexible product choice. You can spray what you want. There are flexible water and spray quality choices. You can spray as much water as you want with whatever nozzles you want. You can get corner to corner coverage and you can adjust that to fit the conditions. The cons of ground rigs are that you have a lower work rate. It takes longer and compaction and travel, especially in wet weather. For aerial systems, the pros are that you have a higher work rate. They get it done quick. There's deferred liability, or not your problem. There's no capital investment unless you're looking to buy a helicopter, and compaction and trample is neutral. The cons? You kind of have to wait for when they can get out to you. There's limited product choice in that they spray what they can spray, and there's limited choice in water volume. They can't carry the same volume a ground rig can, so you'd be wise to get up to five gallons per acre. There's public perception. Some people just don't understand what they're seeing when a plane flies by. And then there's field accessibility. In some cases, you still have to get a rig out to get the helicopter there. Let's take a brief departure at this point and talk about the aerial applications themselves. There's a sort of a misunderstanding out there that a rotary system, a helicopter, drives spray down into a canopy. Well, that's not the case. The fact that the helicopter is in the air at all tells you that it's neutral. Whatever downward force has been neutralized by the upward force. Otherwise, they drop out of the air or fly straight up into it. We've got some slow motion video to show you that when a plane goes over a crop or when a helicopter goes over a crop, the spray looks pretty much the same way. It's released behind the equipment and settles slowly. Here we see the plane with the spray stretched out behind it, the swath slowly falling five to eight seconds after the plane goes by. There's no downward force here. We rely on wind and, if we're lucky, gravity for those droplets to find where they need to go. For the rotary or the helicopter, it looks almost the same. Once again, the spray 
the swath is behind the vehicle as it flies over five to eight seconds and the spray slowly settles. Hey, we just went through northern corn leaf blight and talked about the importance of, of it as well as how it is the most important disease, foliar corn disease we have in the province from, from Windsor to Ottawa and Cornwall as well. Gray leaf spot is another one, one that we often get calls on particularly when we have some injury or damage on those leaves as well. Northern corn leaf blight, remember those elongated cigar shaped lesions and that, gray leaf spot easy to distinguish. It has these very nice characteristic rectangular lesions. They stay within the veins and they go, you know, you can have really small ones and they get larger and larger. And then eventually you can see, as we see here, you can see them going from individual, they start to join. You start getting that, um, you know, that, that blighting area. And if you notice on this one, that leaf is sort of bent over. Where that bend is often, you'll see a lot of disease. In this case, you see gray leaf spot in that area, northern corn leaf blight, you may see one, two, or three, or four lesions starting there. Often that area there, that bend, holds moisture longest during the day, so more favorable environment. So that's always a good spot to look at for many of these foliar leaf diseases. So what's the impact? We've done inoculated trials for gray leaf spot, northern corn leaf blight. Hey, we can get anywhere from 20, 30, 40 bushels on a susceptible variety in terms of yield loss and that. So again, it's an important disease to consider. It is one that you often may see early and it starts from the bottom up. This is a corn soybean wheat rotation here. This hybrid is very susceptible in it. And you can see just how much even un under unfavorable conditions in that um, to see the disease here. And so keep that in mind. Again, the disease that you're targeting, whether it's northern corn leaf blight, gray leaf spot, the ear rots in that, the timing, fungicide choice are critical. Get it where it needs to be. All of these things need to be taken into consideration to maximize your efficacy and often ultimately your return. So last year in Ridgetown, we tested a number of different spray setups. We did aerial, that's helicopter and plane, and we compared it to several ground rigs, front and rear mounted booms, pulse width modulation or conventional. Uh, we did 110 degree flat fans of different spray qualities. We even did a kind of banding application where 60 degree fans were placed over the tassel and 40 degree flat fans were alternated over the rows. We looked at all these systems in the hopes of finding a leader, which one gave us the better coverage. Now, obviously that's not something I can do on my own. So I was really invited by Dr. David Hooker and Albert Tenuta, who are luckily wandering around in the field today. I'm here. <laughs> We're still a distance apart and I'm a hugger, so I'm fighting every urge I have not to grab this guy, but he'll tell you about how we set the experiment up. Yeah, the experiment was set up very similar to our learnings and our experiences from the wheat rodeo. Uh, 15, 16 years earlier. Now this experiment, we also used water sensitive papers to look at coverage and we also used a tracer, a tracer chemical that we can use as a proxy to measure the amount of chemical that got to our target or in the silk area. So a little bit different than the wheat, our target in wheat was the wheat head, we wanted panoramic coverage in corn, our target was the silk and that was where we placed our water sensitive paper. Which we've got if you want to show. All right. We've already kind of shown you what it looks like, but it's amazing to watch it work. For growers who still haven't tried water sensitive paper, instant, instant feedback on whether your spray went where you thought it went. All right, so here's a, a water sensitive paper. So it looks like that. And if this was our target, of course this corn is not at the right stage for spraying. Of course not. So pretend that it's in soaking green silks. What we did was attach the water sensitive paper to the silk area. And then we went out of the field, of course, we did our spraying and then we sprayed, for instance, like this. And then we used this, we collected the papers and then we used this, we analyzed it for coverage mm -hmm. using, um, was it drop scope or drop some scope? So we software. scanned them in. So that told us how much area was covered by spray and even told us how many droplets we had. 
So I got some pretty good coverage right here. That's some pretty sloppy stuff, but yeah. uh, that'd do the trick. So coverage is okay, like visible coverage is, is great, but what it doesn't detect, the software, it doesn't detect those small droplets, right? Well, I have to confess, we did make one small boo-boo, but we learned. When I placed these cards, I only had them sensitive on one side. I should have been cheap and folded them over so we had coverage on both sides. And the reason for that, as we discussed earlier, is that fines move all over the place. And all that spray that maybe went under the paper, we didn't scan it in. So we really did a bit of a disservice to the finer spray. We may have seen coverage on one side, but not the other. And Dave will explain how we use the tracer, and you can see a disconnect between coverage and how much tracer was recovered. And especially if we want to compare the aerial rigs, five gallon per acre versus 20 gallon per acre, of course, we're gonna see some huge differences here in the coverage. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is how much chemical, the active chemical is reaches the silks. And this is where the chemical tracer comes in. And we just, just found tremendous differences between the coverage and the chemical tracer. And we know that the chemical tracer is a much more accurate, paints a much more accurate picture of the efficacy or, or the efficiency of the spray delivery system, how much of the chemical uh, is, um, is applied to the silks. Absolutely. And the reason for that is coverage and dose aren't really the same thing. Just because you see an area covered, it doesn't tell you how much actual product was in that volume. So what Dave did was take those papers and set fire to them, which is just a riot. Uh, we used copper sulfate, which burns green. And this technique, flame emission photometry, tells us exactly how much product is found. So while we could compare coverage to coverage, and we could compare, compare the uh, tracer die to the tracer die, we just couldn't compare them back and forth. And when we do this again next year, we'll do it different. So what did we see? Which, which system should the operator use? Well, I've got quite a nice set of results to show you. And so what we did, we had 180 papers per sprayer. And so tremendous amount of papers that we had set aside for each to test each sprayer. So we can not only get the average coverage, what the average coverage was, but we could determine or estimate the variability of coverage from, for instance, from silk to silk. So that is important. So the amount of chemical and plus the, the spatial variability, those are two objectives that we had. Mm -hmm. Now we noticed that the drop nozzles, the both the undercover system, the Yield Center 360, and the um, the 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 homemade duo, the homemade <laughs> duo drop nozzle they both perform very well. They had the highest coverage, chemical coverage, um, of all of the systems that we tried. This really didn't come as a huge surprise for one very basic reason: when you change where the droplet is released, you've got much greater odds of it getting where it's going. Uh, earlier, we said just imagine the corn from the top from the droplet's point of view. That droplet is being asked to go around this leaf, come this way, move left, go around the tassel, get around Dave, and then come up underside a leaf or on the silk. That's a lot to ask of a droplet. But with a drop arm or a drop hose system, you've changed the nozzle's point of release right next to the target. So now it only has to go this far. It doesn't have to go this far, and it doesn't filter through the canopy to get there. So they were both really impressive compared to, say, the aerial, which, admittedly, we... Uh, probably could do a better job uh, recovering the amount of dye, but certainly it outperformed the other ground rigs with an overhead broadcast application. And this leads us to what we want to do next year, because we had fun scanning all these papers. We want to do this all over again. Uh, mm -hmm. This time, of course, I'll fold or double the papers because 180 per rig just didn't eat up enough of my life scanning those in. We're going to go over here for a moment and show you the two technologies we're going to compare next year, along with some other setups. Was there other stuff that you wanted to, to mention about that? Well, just the air induction system, air induction oh. nozzles, the coarse droplets, they did not achieve as uniform coverage as they wanted, more variability. Mm -hmm. And maybe that has to do with those finer droplets. They just behave yeah. differently than the coarse droplets do. Well, the coarse ones will land on the first thing they hit, and there's a lot of opportunity for that. You don't get as many of them, and you don't get that kind of randomness that we would expect from the fines. Mm -hmm. But at least we know which way they're going, unlike mm -hmm. the fines where, let's just yep. hope. That's, that's right. So we're looking at coverage here, but we also need to look at efficacy. Efficacy in terms of the disease we want to control or the toxin that we want to reduce. And so we, we really need to do more work looking at those Yeah, at that's those a great point. Just because you got more spray there, 
maybe dead is dead. Maybe you didn't need more spray there. So we always follow up coverage yeah. work with efficacy. Exactly. Now we'll show you the two drop arm systems we're gonna look at next year. So let's wrap all this up with a bit of a teaser trailer for what we hope to accomplish next year. We're going to get all the same uh, characters back, uh, the rotary, the fixed wing system, a lot of the ground rigs, but we're gonna look a little more closely at the drop arms. To my left here, we have the Y drop with the undercover 360, and this is the part that we really wanna focus on. This is sort of a, a nozzle body, a cluster of nozzles that will release the spray from inside the canopy, and it performed very well in our experiments, but there are some limitations. It's pricey, but you pay for good things. It also weighs a lot. So an operator has a reduced work rate in that they have to fold their boom into about 90 feet, otherwise it just sags horribly. Uh, we did like what we saw with the homemade system, but the problem with homemade drops is that they tend to wiggle and wobble a lot, and in this case, we could have done a better job. The nozzles really aren't, weren't oriented how we would like. But a new technology came to light, and we're gonna give it a shot next year. This is by Agritop, and it's distributed by Greenleaf. Uh, this is the Beluga, and it's called a Beluga because of this little unit right here. So what you have to picture is that this is hung on the boom, and then we tie this into a nozzle body. We just take the cap and nozzle off and plug it in, very much the way the 360 works. And then we use a small piece of metal on the boom, which I'm holding here, and then we key the drop arm right into it. And what's nice is it finds its own plumb. It'll be vertical. Now, admittedly, it's probably gonna shuffle and wiggle around a lot, but I don't suspect that'll play uh, a big role in the coverage. I guess we'll find out. But the beauty is in the, the nozzle body itself. This is the beluga, this little streamlined football of a thing. And on the back, we have two nozzles that are facing out inter row to the canopy itself. And the fans that this will produce will be like this. They'll be parallel with the corn. So if this is the corn, as the spray passes by, we have this whole vertical swath that should cover the entire part of the canopy from inside the canopy. And I haven't bothered to put this on because you have to figure out the right height and distance, but we'll have one about here and we'll have another about here. And as long as we have a lift kit or a front mounted sprayer where the boom can get over the tassels, these will hang into a row. You better hope that you plant it straight or you're gonna get in trouble but these have the potential to do a great job, and I guess we'll find out next year if they're worth it. Hey, what about a drone? And of course, nobody cares about spraying unless there's a drone, so we're gonna get a drone too. There you have it. Hope you enjoyed episode number six of Ontario Diagnostic Days. All you need to know about sprayer application. On our next episode, we're gonna focus on crop rotational studies and how they can help you manage your crop. We'll have that on October 7th. We'll see you then.